Welcome to the fourth episode of The Lowdown. I'm your episode host, Ilan Selby. Today's episode is a special podcast for Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'll shortly be joined by Professor Philippe Sands KC as we discuss his familial experience with the Shoah, as well as two of his books, East West Street and The Rat Line. Two books that I cannot recommend highly enough, which explore the Jewish legal minds behind the implementation of human rights law at the Nuremberg Trials and the story of a senior Nazi seeking to escape justice in Europe in the 1940s, respectively. I'm sure this discussion will be hugely relevant as we look to the future of Holocaust remembrance and education, as we are sadly all too aware that those who survived the Shoah will not be with us forever. After this discussion, young Jews from across Europe will join together in reciting a powerful commemorative poem in memory of the victims of the Shoah. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Philippe Sands to the podcast. Welcome, Philippe, and thank you for joining us. Really, really lovely to join you. Um, as I, I indicated in my reply, this is an audience I care about very much and so very happy to have this conversation with you. That's fantastic to hear, and I'm sure everyone uh, listening as well is delighted to be hearing from you. Professor Sands is a specialist in international law. He appears as counsel and advocate before many international courts and tribunals, including the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights and the International Criminal Court. Professor Sands is also a writer who has written numerous books, two of which will form the stimulus to our discussion today. East West Street on the Origins of Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity, published in 2016, and The Rattling. Love, Lies and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive, published in 2020. Thank you once again for joining The Lowdown today, Philippe. I'd like to start by asking you about your own family experience with the Shoah, a key theme in East West Street, as you write about your relationship and interactions with your paternal grandfather, Leon. Just how prominent were familial discussions on the Holocaust in your family? Yeah, it was a big, big part of my life. Um, not just my grandfather, obviously, but my mum, who was born in Vienna in July 1938 and who was um, taken to safety in when she was a year old in July 39. We never really knew what had happened. That was one of the things that I wanted to sort of explore. I, I like many people, I think I grew up in a in an environment, a very happy one, but of silence, where people just didn't want to talk about what had happened. My grandfather had left Vienna in January 39. I thought he'd left with his wife and daughter, my mum, but in fact, they had stayed on. My mum stayed for a few more months, then joined my grandfather in Paris, and my grandmother stayed on until the end of 1941, and at the very last moment was able to get out. Um, they all went to Paris. They were separated. My mother was basically farmed out to a small town outside Paris called Meudon, uh, where she was looked after, I think, by a series of Catholic families who looked after her, basically saved her. My grandparents lived in Paris. Um, they stayed living openly in Paris, but they were warned. They had a friend in the police who warned them every time there was going to be a half. My grandfather lost pretty much every member of his family. So we're talking 70, 80 people. And um, I knew as a kid growing up, it was a big thing. But we also knew, don't ask questions about it. They don't want to talk about it. As you say, that's that's quite common. We hear that a lot, don't we? Going further into your book, East West Street traces the lives of two leading Jewish figures in the history of human rights law. One is Hersch Lauterpach, the mind behind the indictment of crimes against humanity, and the other Raphael Lemkin, the mind behind the crime of genocide. Now, you research these two figures extensively, and so I wonder how strong do you believe their Jewish identities were in influencing their careers in pursuit of justice? And also the same question to you in your career. So um, when I, well, I mean, one of this started, I was 50 years old uh, when it, I really started looking into it. I got this invitation to give a lecture in this university in Lviv. I didn't really know where Lviv was. I checked it out. I noticed that it was the same place as Lvov and Lemberg and that was my grandfather was born in 1904. It's today in Ukraine, used to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, then Poland. And I thought, I'll go and I'll see whether I can find my grandfather's house. I mean, it was really an issue of identity. I want, I wanted to know more about him, which was a way of knowing more about me. Um, so so I, I accepted the invitation. 
And I was astonished to discover that um, these two extraordinary characters, Herschel Alterpatch and Raphael Lemkin, both of whom were known to me by reputation and name, but I didn't know anything about them in detail, had basically come from the same town. In fact, incredibly, they'd been students at the same law school that had invited me, but the folks at the law school didn't know anything about it. And so there began the seeds for a book. I explore a little bit in both books their own backgrounds, very different men, Lauterpacht and Lemkin. Lauterpacht, sort of more urbane, urban, um, Lemkin, rural, um, very different characters. Lauterpacht, a scholar, Lemkin, a prosecutor, both with deeply religious backgrounds. They both describe that in writing and talking about and grew up. Um, in those environments, you know, in the 1910s and the 1920s. And I think it influenced them greatly. I mean, they were both, I mean, they grew up in religious households, but more to the point, I think both were very deeply affected by what was going on around two Jewish communities, pogroms and uh, other terrible things. And I think they were looking for ways of using the power of the law to offer greater protection, not just for Jews, but for all groups of people who were threatened. And they chose different paths. Lauterpacht went for the protection of the individual, crimes against humanity. Lemkin went for the crime of genocide, um, the protection of groups. In relation to my own upbringing, I had a you know modest Jewish upbringing. I had a bar mitzvah and I am Jewish and I'm not a sort of practicing Jew. We do Seder and we do bits and pieces, but I'm undoubtedly Jewish and very public about that. And and it is undoubtedly a part of my identity, certainly in terms of family background. And I think one of the things that has impacted on me is just doing this research and getting to know more about my grandfather and his background and putting, you know, faces and stories to people that you knew vaguely about terrible things that happened definitely has an impact on identity. And so I feel, um, I'd say after this experience, more rather than less connected uh, to my Jewish identity. It's been, a, it's been a very interesting and good road, actually. You know, talking about your identity, it shows in the entry connected to, to these books. I think you're in the synagogue in, in Lviv itself, isn't it? Actually, in, in a, it's a smaller town. It's about 25 kilometers from Lviv. It's called, it was called Zulkiev, and it's where where Schlauterpacht was born and where my great-grandmother was born, literally on the same street, East-West Street, as it's called, hence the title of the book. And of course, there's an amazing coincidence because my main teacher of international law at university was the son of Hirsch Lauterpacht, Elie Lauterpacht. We were very close. We worked together for more than 30 years. And it was only after about 30 years that I uncovered, as part of this research, that we could trace our roots to the very same street in this very small town. And yes, um, the film is called My Nazi Legacy. It was a BBC Storyville film. And it was very affecting to be in Lviv and Zhulkio with the sons of the man who was the fourth man in the story, East West Street, Hans Frank, who was Adolf Hitler's lawyer uh, for many years before becoming governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland, to travel back to the area of these terrible events with both sons and indeed to go to the synagogue, which is of now a very sad place and an empty place, um, and having a discussion in which very plainly, and as you say, visibly, I'm very affected by my surroundings, although that was deeply affecting, but it was as nothing compared to the mass grave just outside the town. About a kilometre from the town, there is a mass grave. All of the Jews, three and a half thousand people, were executed on a single day. They, I mean, they were buried and killed and buried in a in this now sort of sand pit just outside the town. And I went there with the son of Nicholas Frank and the son of Otto Wechter, and it was deeply, deeply affecting. And there's no question that, that it touched upon matters of my own identity and my own background and my sense of connection with people who were there and still there today simply because they were Jewish. So a profound impact, yes. No, absolutely. The documentary, I think, almost in a way brings to life this book even even more um, through, like you say, your relationship with uh, Nicholas and, and Horst. Um, now, moving on to your your second book, The Rat Line, Love Lies and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive. The book, as we've alluded to, traces the life of a senior Nazi, Otto von Wechter, 
who governed Krakow between 1939 and 1942. What struck me when reading the book was just the, the sheer level of research that had gone into it. What surprised me the most, perhaps, was this diary kept by, by the wife of von Vechter, Charlotte, which was such a valuable resource for you. I'm curious, why did you decide to focus on the life of von Vechter, a perpetrator of, of such immense suffering, as opposed to perhaps to the life of a victim? Again, a, a very good question. The, the way that it happened relates to uh, the previous part of our conversation. So we were in Lviv and Zhulkiev filming, and Horst Vechter, the son of Otto Vechter, who was governor of Galicia, and before that, Krakow. I mean, Otto Vechter is the guy who constructed the Warsaw, the, the Krakow ghetto. I mean, this, you're talking about a mass murder of first class. And I'd come to know the son, and we were filming together in Lviv, and Horst Vechter, the son, had wanted our visit to coincide with an event in July 2014, an annual event, the commemoration of the Waffen-SS Galicia Division founded by his father, the first division of the Waffen-SS, which involved non-Germans. So we went there and it was just appalling. There were, you know, hundreds of people, lots of them dressed in SS uniforms, you know, prancing around, pretending to celebrate or celebrating the events of, you know, 1941 when the Germans took over. And Nicholas Frank was truly horrified. And after the day I, the next day I interviewed him and he said in the course of the interview, actually, I think, um, Horst Wächter may be a new kind of a Nazi. He said on camera, I disagreed with that. And I do disagree with that. I don't think he is. Um, but it was shocking. Horst saw the film, didn't like it, obviously didn't like being called a Nazi. And I understand nevertheless, his behavior was pretty shocking on that day. Um, and he said, how can I prove that I'm not a Nazi? And I thought about it and I knew there was this family archive, 10,000 pages. And I just said to him, well, why don't you give it to a museum? Because Nazis don't give these kinds of family documents to museums. He said, terrific idea. Which museum? United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, who could digitize it and make it publicly available in high quality. And he agreed and he gave everything to them. And then he said, would you like a copy? And I said, okay, sure. And then sort of two weeks later, a sort of USB stick landed through my letterbox, a recycled envelope. It started looking into the materials. And we had basically the entire life of a top table Nazi couple from 1929 to 1949. No one had ever seen material like this before. And it was extraordinary. And I wanted to understand how could two highly intelligent, highly educated individuals get involved in such atrocities. That's what I wanted to know. Um, and that became the genesis for the book. So it's not that I, it was an accident. It's not that I set out to write this kind of book. I just, I love this kind of archival material and the material as you, you've read it, it's extraordinary material. And it tells a story which is complex because there are aspects of them, but in particular Charlotte, which is sort of mildly sympathetic. It's, it's just wrong in my view to paint these people just as one-sided monsters actually they have humanity they have decency they have a sense of humor their parents and that's the problem you know you could meet them in a restaurant sit down have dinner with them and it would be a perfectly normal conversation and that's what i find so fascinating and that relates to my work i do cases about crimes against humanity and genocide i meet some pretty bad people and yet they're incredibly genial um and that is the mystery of life we've we've all met people like that Absolutely. And, you know, Holocaust denial, distortion, revisionism, all these sorts of nuances of, of, of like you say, denying the Holocaust to, to various extents um, are things that our unions and our network are dealing with a lot. I mean, I mean to, to be clear, I want to be fair to Horst. Horst sure. is definitely not a Holocaust denier. He totally accepts everything. And um, he also recognizes that his father was deeply involved, but, and his where the rubber hits the road, his view is his father wasn't responsible. He was just one of those people who was sucked into the whole system. And I don't buy that, as you know from the book. I don't mm -hmm. accept that. And I find it very interesting, therefore, how the next generation or generations can buy into particular narratives as to what is going on. So this is a matter of great interest for me. But I should say, you know, not just in relation to Germans and Jews and Poles and Ukrainians. It's the work that I do around the world. And so it is of deep and abiding interest to me. 
And and how difficult was it for you to sort of maintain a relationship with with horse? Like you mentioned there that you know you can be at a dinner and it it wouldn't be an issue, but it clearly is definitely. I saw this in the documentary that it affects you at different moments. You describe at one point it um there was one moment in which you visibly got angry at, at horse's reaction when you're showing him some evidence of his father's involvement in in various crimes. So yeah, how how was the relationship? My mother-in-law calls that the elder abuse moment where I <laughs> turn on horse. I mean, you have to understand I've been a barrister for 35 years. So we're trained not to show emotion. We're trained to stay cool, calm, collected. Well, I managed that 98 and a half percent of the time, but there were, you know, whatever my inner feelings were, which were boiling over at times, I knew that in order to maintain the conversation and basically keep Horst talking, which was really important for me, attacking him or his dad or his mum was not the best way to do it. So for the most part, it comes from my training. You know, it's like having a witness in in, in the box. When you're cross-examining a witness, you don't shout at them, you don't abuse them, because the moment that happens, people clam up. So you've got to find a way of communicating. But it is true that there were moments, particularly in Lviv, uh, where... I found it very, very difficult, and I couldn't really contain myself completely. But we're still in touch. I wouldn't say we're close friends, but we have stayed in touch. I'm very close to Nicholas Frank, and that is ironic, because, of course, Hans Frank was caught, was tried, was convicted, and sentenced to death at Nuremberg for the murder of four million human beings, three million Jews and a million Poles. Imagine for a moment what it's like to grow up as a kid with a dad who's done that. It's very tough. Nicholas is a remarkable person, and we are dear, dear friends. And um, he has, uh, you know, fought a one-man campaign to show what a poisonous man his father was. And I deeply respect the way he's done that. So these issues are complex, but I'm a passionate believer in talking. It is terribly important to talk. And that's perhaps quite a nice segue onto onto the last question. Um, on the podcast, we like to end each lowdown interview with a question of empowerment for young Jews in Europe. And so I wonder what advice do you have for for young European Jews who want to be involved in, in cultivating the memory of the Shoah? Well, we're at a point, sadly, where the generation that lived through that dreadful experience is coming to an end. I mean, my mum was born in 1938. She's going to be one of the very last. And of course, she has no direct real memories of, of it. Or if she does, she's really suppressed a lot of them. And so the baton is passed on to the next generation. In fact, this is a really interesting time that we're talking because a dear friend of mine, you will have read this, no doubt, in the papers, Benjamin Ferenc, who was the last living prosecutor uh, at Nuremberg, died a couple of days ago, aged 103. I knew him yeah. well. And that memory, that direct experience, which is so important in helping us understand what happened precisely to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, although it has in other parts of the world and in other contexts, uh, is is extinguished. So that imposes a responsibility on me. And then, of course, next, your generation and my kids' generation. And I think that means talking about it in a, in a good way, in a decent way, writing about it. Obviously, I, I write about it. And I think engaging very honestly and openly. I, I mean, my own position is that I sort of resist. Yeah. To give you an anecdote, I, was once, I once did a book talk at the Los Angeles um, Holocaust Museum. And there was a lady there, it was very delicate, who had been at Auschwitz, you know. So, of course, I'm deeply, deeply respectful and, and very careful. And she said, after I'd spoken, she said, Mr. Sands, I noticed that um, you never said the Holocaust was the worst thing that ever happened in the whole world. And I said, no, I didn't. And I tried to avoid um, a sort of league table of horrors. Um, because when you're on the receiving end of a particular horror, and I mentioned Rwanda, for you and your family, and that will seem like the worst thing in the world. Same with the Yazidis or the Rohingya or the Uyghurs or whoever it may be. And so, you know, she said, yes, but in Rwanda, they only killed them with machetes. It wasn't industrial. So I find that very problematic. I think, I think we, I understand it. And I understand that she had been through this dreadful experience. But, but I think we have a responsibility 
to recognize horror in its universal aspects and be very respectful um, of the difficulties suffered by others. And, and I've got to say, since we're on the, the podcast, I, like many others, I'm so very deeply troubled by some of the things that are going on right now in Israel, in some sections of the community, describing Palestinians in ways that I'm very sorry to say begin to sound a little bit familiar to someone like me who's steeped in another period. And I think one of the things we have to do is just keep talking, avoid the kind of language that expresses the desire to do horrible things to any particular group just because they are a group. That's the heart uh, of the issue, but also very much to keep the flame alive. I mean, it's not a coincidence I've written these books and the next book that I'm doing which takes a minor character in the rat line, a guy called Walter Ralph, who was the inventor of the mobile gas chamber and escaped to Chile in the end. I'm writing his story in Chile in Pinochet's regime. Um, we need to keep the flame alive, but also keep our eyes open to other things that may be happening that trouble us um, and be firm and be principled and respectful. No, I think that's very well put. And uh I would just encourage everyone really to to have a read of of the books of East West Street, The Rat Line, and to watch the documentary as well, My Nazi Legacy. Uh, I look forward to reading uh, your next project, Philippe. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure being with you. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. And I believe in love, even when there is no one there. And I believe in God, even when he is silent. I believe through any trial, there is always a way. But sometimes in this suffering and hopeless despair, my heart cries for shelter to know someone's there. But a voice rises within me saying, hold on, my child, I'll give you strength. I'll give you hope. To stay a little while. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. And I believe in love, even when there's no one there. And I believe in God, even when he is silent. I believe through any trial, there is always a way. May there someday be sunshine. May there someday be happiness. May there someday be love. May there someday be peace.